reading today is from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 22 and reading verses 1 to 5. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. From there David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Now, the first word of the Shema is hear or listen, which in Hebrew is pronounced Shema. That's where the prayer gets its name. Now, Shema is a really common word in the Hebrew Bible, and it's obvious why. Hearing is a very universal activity. It's usually connected with the ear, as in Proverbs chapter 20, ears that Shema and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. Now, that seems basic enough, but if you look at the other ways that Hebrew authors can use the word Shema, they use it to mean more than just let sound waves enter your ear. In Hebrew, Shema can also mean pay attention to or focus on. So when Leah, who wasn't loved by her husband Jacob, she has a son and she names him Simon, or in Hebrew, Shimon, because she says, the Lord has Shamad, that I am unloved. So Shema means to hear and to pay attention to and even more. It can also mean responding to what you hear. This is why so many of the cries for help in the book of Psalms begin with a call that God listen. Psalm 27 verse 7, Shema my voice when I call, O Lord, be merciful, answer me. So asking God to Shema is at the same time asking God to act, to do something. It's similar to when God asks people to listen. Like when the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, God says, if you shema me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Now, there's a couple interesting things about this verse in Exodus. In Hebrew, the word shema is repeated twice in this sentence to give it emphasis. If you shema shema, meaning listen closely. But also notice that from God's point of view, listening is basically the same as keeping the covenant. So when God asks the people to shema, what he means is that they listen and obey. And that's the last fascinating thing about Shema. In ancient Hebrew, there is no separate word for obey, meaning to carry out the wishes of someone who knows better than you or is in authority over you. So in the Bible, if you want to say, I will listen and do what you say, you use the single word Shema. In Hebrew, listening and doing are two sides of the same coin. This is why later in Israel's history, when the people were breaking their covenant promises to God, the Hebrew prophets would say things like, they have ears, but they're not listening. The Israelites, of course, could hear just fine, but they weren't actually listening or else they would act differently. And so in the end, listening in the Bible is about giving respect to the one speaking to you and doing what they say. Real listening takes effort and action. And that's the Hebrew word Shema. So Father, as we uh, come to Shema to your word this morning, 
uh, we pray that you would uh, not only give us ears that hear, but hearts, uh, minds that understand and hearts that respond to you. Uh, Father, for we want to be a people who, uh, who have a heart after you, Lord God. Lord, that we would bless you in all that we do. Um, that we would see your kingdom come and your will be done. Amen. Right. <clears throat> Well, uh, there's nothing like a terrifying experience to help focus the, sh the mind. It can really get you Um <clears throat> One story that sticks out uh, in my mind was when I started building on my own in, in Dunedin. Um, up to that point, I'd always worked with my dad. Uh, from about 14 or 15, all, every school holidays onwards, I was on the building site. Um, building was just something I drifted into. Um, I'd always worked with my dad. Um, I used building to supplement my church habit as the years went on. Um, but, but then, of course, um, I made the decision to train for the ministry, which was the time that I left Wellington. And in the holidays, I needed some money. So what did I do? Got out the hammer. Um, and, and so one day, my boss took me down to an empty site, and we marked out the foundation. And then at the end of the day, he turned to me and he said, Nick, he says, it's all yours. Build a spec house for me. <laughs> and, and, and I was terrified. <clears throat> and, and this is the crazy thing was, I'd been building for quite some time now. But I'd never been in charge of anything or a project by myself before. You know, I'd always relied on having dad around or someone else. And so I was kind of, like I say, I was terrified. Uh, but as I looked, I thought, well, what's the, what's the only thing I can do? Well, it's the next step. And of course, we, we'd, um, we'd kind of set out all the, um, we'd marked all the foundation out. So the next step was putting down the plates. And once I put down the plates, which is like the timber around the, out, the frame of the house, I, I, I guess the next thing I had to do was build the foundation, dig the foundations. Uh, and then, of course, I started framing for the concrete pour for the slab and then put the steel in. And then one thing just followed another and another. And before I knew it, the house was up. And, and what I realized in that experience, what it taught me was everything that I needed was in my head. I, I simply just needed to walk it out. And I think that's a similar experience for all of us. I think we can all relate to that fear of terror. We've had it at least at one stage in our lives, I'm sure. Um, when we feel we're out beyond our depth, you know, maybe it was our first day of school. Um, that might be a long way back for some of you. Um, maybe, maybe it was your first day at a new job or, or your first time as a parent, uh, first time in a new country, or, or even the first time facing redundancy. Uh, these can be terrifying experiences for all of us. But what we don't realize is often that when we arrive at these situations, we're often more equipped than we think we are because, because God's gone before us and he's been preparing us. He's kind of put all these things, all these steps in our heads. And generally when we're pushed out into situations that take us out of our comfort zones, um, what we find is these are the perfect environments for us to grow. These are the times when we learn to listen to God and we gain confidence in Him and, um, and also in who it is that God's made us to be. And so terrifying experiences can sometimes be great for growing our faith. Uh, but when we're safe and secure, of course, that we can struggle to grow in our faith because we've got other options, don't we? We can put our trust in other things. But when we're in, when we're in new territory, um, it forces us to put our trust in God. And we see this being played out in the life of David and in the story of David. Uh, last week we talked about David having everything he needed. Um, until King Saul got jealous of him, of course. And then David was chased out of town before they killed him. Um, and in 1 Samuel 22 verses 1 to 2, we read, David, led, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to see him there. Um, and all of those who were in distress or debt or discontent gathered around him. And David became their commander. Um, about 400 men were with him. So, so here we find David, you know, once a great general, a great leader, with all these people kind of around him, all these trained soldiers at, um, at, at his command. Um, now David was living, he was, that was all aside, now he was living as a, as a refugee with his family and a bunch of people who all had issues. They had the three Ds, distress, debt, discontent. Now, these weren't heroic people like the people David was used to having under his command. These were people with problems. And I'm sure that David, as he was looking around, he, he was thinking, God, 
what on earth is going on here? Where are you? You know, what am I going to do with all of these guys? Uh, and then in 1 Samuel 23, something else occurs. David hears the story. Here's a story about Keliah, or Kila, I should say, a city of Israel. And, and it was a city under siege by the Philistines. And immediately, David starts thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do here? You see, David realized there was a problem. People of Israel were in danger. And, and this is an important point to note in this situation, that while God had changed David's situation, God hadn't changed David's heart. And David still had this passion for the people of Israel, didn't he? David had a heart to protect those in danger. And, and we, we see this, this, um, this uh, explanation of David's heart. We actually, it's one of the first things we, we find out about David. Um, in 1 Samuel 17, um, when David's um, fighting Goliath, um, David's brought to King Saul, and, and King Saul says, why do you want to take on Goliath? And you know what David replies? He says, hey, he says, this guy is threatening your people, and, and when I was a shepherd, I was looking after my, my father's flock. He said, when a lion or a bear came along, I struck it and I rescued it. And the Lord res who rescued me from the, the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. See, David was a protector. This was, this was his passion, to care for his people in danger. And the thing that inspired him when he was a humble shepherd was the thing that inspired him now. It was in, like I said, it was in his DNA. But of course, David was in a different situation to, to back then. Back then he had an army around him. Now he had the discontent and the distressed. He, he didn't have these well-trained soldiers. So what was he gonna do? Well, I guess the first thing David did was the first thing I always encourage you to do when you're in a situation. Go to God. David went to God. He asked God, what am I going to do here? And God said, go. And so David said, okay. And then David, he told David's men. And David's men said, what? He said, haven't we got enough enemies already? <laughs> we need to take on the Philistine army as well. But, but David had made up his mind, and so David went. And his people, funnily enough, they just tagged along. They followed. And they won the victory. The Philistines ran. But of course, once they'd won, David was faced with another question. Shall I stay? You know, I, I can't help but imagine that after an unexpected victory like this, David would have thought, well, hey, perhaps this is going to be where my situation's going to change. Perhaps this is going to be the place where I'm going to rise to power again like I used to be before King Saul kind of chased me out of town. So David once again asked God, he said, OK, what do we do here? Do I stay? And God said, no. You know, Saul is going to be coming with his army and the people of the city are going to turn you over to him because they're afraid of him. And so David, once again, went running away. Um, him and his men running away like criminals into the wilderness for the next seven years. And, and so you might ask, well, listening to all that, well, well, what was the point of this adventure? See, on the one hand, it seems like God called David to risk his life for no reason at all. At all. God called David to be loyal to a city that was not going to be loyal to him. You know, you could say if you were thinking of it strategically, this was a bit of a mistake. This mission was a bit of wasted expenditure. But what I want to ask you this morning, or, or suggest to you, is, is what if God was more concerned with David's personal development than he was a bit, than about David's personal advancement? What if, what if God was more concerned about David's personal development than he was about David's personal advancement? You see, it would have been really nice for David if he could have avoided seven years in the wilderness wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't it? I would have thought so. You know, but, but I wonder, would David have a, would have learned to trust God to the extent that he did if he had this elite group of well-trained soldiers and a, and a life, perfect life? Would he, have trust, would he have had the need to trust God? That wasn't rhetorical. I was asking you the question. Okay, good. All right. Get back into this. I'm not, I'm not a camera anymore. <clears throat> I just expected you'd been answering me to the TV screen. Oh. Anyway, but, but you see, there comes a time for each one of us when we have to learn how to trust God, don't we? Uh, trust Him for ourselves. And this is what God taught David in the wilderness. 
You see, in the wilderness, God showed David that he could be counted on when everything else failed. And every, when everyone around him failed. You see, in the time of the wilderness, David learned to lead people who were not easy people to lead. And it was in the time of the wilderness when David learned to obey the voice of God rather than the circumstances that were around him. And what I want to suggest to you that this speaks to us is that David's story is similar to our story. See, perhaps you're going through a time where life has not been heading in the direction you expected it to go. Maybe your plans have been disrupted. You thought you'd find yourself over here and instead you find yourself down here. This is not the place where you wanted to be. Well, keep in mind that the things that God taught David in the wilderness served to strengthen David for the greater plans that God had for his life. Years and years later, after all this had passed and David um, became a king of, of Israel, he was able to face challenges from kings and nations that sought to destroy him. With, and he was able to face them with great confidence because he knew he'd been down this path before. He'd faced down an army of Philistines with a tiny group of 400 disgruntled, debt-ridden refugees. He'd lived in the wilderness for years, evading death at the hand of Saul, a king with all the resources that Israel could have. But he survived because the hand of God was upon him. And when you've been in situations like that, and you know that you've survived in that environment because God has led you at that time, then that gives you the confidence that you can steer down any similar kind of threat in the future. And this was definitely true of David's story. Because not only, um, but not only did um, God use David, uh, the wilderness to hone David's confidence in him, God also used this time in the wilderness to hone David's passion. As I said earlier, what was David's passion? Protecting people. It was something that stirred his heart. And this time in the wilderness provided David plenty of opportunities to protect people, didn't it? Um, for the, there were the people in need, like the people in Keilah, um, but there were others as well. And it was in the wilderness that David's reputation as a trustworthy leader was built from the ground roots up. See, everybody knew that David was the guy who looked, the one who looked after the little guy. And they saw his passion and they trusted him. And so when David's time eventually came and God raised David to become a king, he was the first person that everyone looked to because they recognized the passion that was coming out from him. And what is it? So what is your passion? You know, another way that you could ask this perhaps is, what is it that makes your heart sing? What gets you up in the morning? It's certainly not the weather at the moment. See, it's, it's, it's important to discover what your passion is. You know, we could have a passion a bit like David. We could have a heart to protect people or a heart to help people out. We could have a passion to teach or make people understand things. Or, or we could have a passion to make people feel welcome. We could have a passion to communicate the gospel in a creative way, a bit like those guys in that video have done. Or help others encounter the love of Jesus for themselves. You know, we all have different things that drive us, different passions that make our hearts sing. And, and these things are important if we want to live a life that is meaningful and a life that has purpose. But unfortunately, what I suspect is most of the time, we don't take the time to ask ourselves this very important question. You know, because we just get busy falling into whatever it takes to pay the bills. But when God draws us into the wilderness we suddenly find that we've got the time to ask ourselves these kind of important questions. You know, sometimes there's good things that come out of lockdowns. You know, we have the opportunity to refocus our priorities and reevaluate re our opportunities. And this is where God shapes us into greatness. <laughs> now, um, I, I wonder, have, have many of you heard of CAP, Christians Against Poverty? Hands up. Okay, so a, few, a number of you, a few of you. Um, well, for those of you who don't know, this was an organization um, started by a guy called John Kirkby um, in Bradford in England in 1996. Um, and when it started, so that's about 24 years ago, um, John was a fairly new Christian. He'd only been a Christian a couple of years. Um, he'd come to, come to Christ after um, losing his business 
um, and, and um, it was after one of the stock market crashes, he lost and he lost his wife as a result of that, and um, pretty much everything he had. And, and uh, a bunch of Christians got around him and kind of just encouraged him. And he found the Lord and kind of started to get his life back on track. He remarried, started a new business. Things started to get in, cut, start, started to all kind of fall into place again when he felt God calling him to help. Um, and it was particularly he, had a, he discovered he had a heart for others who had been in the same position he'd been in. And so he began this thing he called Christians Against Poverty, which was helping people who'd gone into financial situations that had spiraled way out of control um, and showing them the love of Jesus in a practical way. Um, he, he was working with people who'd been crippled by debt, um, with working with parents who couldn't feed their children, families facing eviction and, and, and desperate people, um, some because of their own fault, some because of just circumstance. And he was able to use the expertise he had uh, with, with business, being able to negotiate with creditors, um, helping people set up budgeting systems. And he started having some amazing results. Um, because not only was he chasing people, changing people's uh, situations, people were coming to know Jesus as a result. But it is interesting, as God was calling him into this, God also called him into a time of wilderness. Because as, they, as he started doing this and kind of committing his energy into this, he was struggling to pay the bills himself. He, he barely made it through those initial, those initial years. And, and this continued for some time. But in this time, um, God would continue to grow him and his wife and the, 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 the team he had around him and, and, and hone their passion. And, and they grew in their confidence in him. Now, now 24 years later, it's a different story. Uh, John now has a CME which is, I don't know what it means, but it means you get to see the prince. Uh, and CAP has expanded right through the Great Britain and Canada and Australia, United States, and even in our country, even in New Zealand, where they have 40 staff and operate through hundreds of churches throughout New Zealand. I'm helping people out of debt and into financial freedom. Um, and I think that's an incredibly inspiring story. But I think the thing that struck me was just like David, it started in the wilderness. You know, so this was where John learned to trust God and to, to hear him and to follow him and to hone that passion. And, and whether you like it or not, the wilderness is where God will grow you as well. So I want to encourage you this morning. If this is where you're at, um, be encouraged uh, because the wilderness is God's training ground for us. It's where he is building into us the fullness, all of the fullness that he's planned for us. So if you're a little disheartened um, it, it, where you're at at the moment, just remember the important thing in the wilderness is just some, one simple thing. Focus on the next step. Just like me on the building site. You know, God's already put all this stuff in there. Just start with the first step. Ask God, God, but like David, what do you want me to do here? And trust that God can speak to you. You see, um, you can be as thick as a plank. God knows how to get through to you. That's good news, isn't it? He knows your language. So there we go. Listen. Make that step. And, and trust that God will bring you out the other side in his good time. Shall we pray? Father, I know I'm, I'm sure that we all don't appreciate being stuck in the wilderness. But we do thank you for the promise we have in your word. Uh, in the life of David, we see that you use these times to shape us. And you use these times to shape our confidence in you. So Lord, may the wilderness times that we face grow us. Lord, and grow us into who you've made us to be. Lord, you're the one who knows our hopes and our dreams better than anyone else. You're the one who designed us and you know exactly what we're best suited for. So, Father, I ask that you would help us work um, with you rather than work against you. And help us, Lord, not to lose faith in the midst of adversity. Pour your Holy Spirit now into each and every one of us. Fill us afresh. Stir up our passions. Stir up our gifts that you've given us. So, Lord, that we, at the right time, would take our place in serving you in your kingdom. That, that we would be the ones who would bring hope and healing 
in the name of Jesus Christ to all those around us who are struggling and lost. That people would see the love of Jesus in the way that we love each other and we love those around us. Pray this for your glory, Lord. Amen.